Okay, let's begin. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Good, good afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, to welcome Sir Richard Roberts, Nobel Laureate in Physiology, 1993, to our chemistry department and I am sure most of you or some of you must have attended his uh, lecture this uh, morning at the uh, NCCS which was also webcasted and we thought that after that lecture we can have a, an interactive session with the students, the, the, the faculty from the department as well as from other departments to have a session interaction, a very informal question answer session where I would not say doubts, but where we can ask for tips to better our academic life, students academic life in, 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 the, in the future because he has been propagating several uh, tips in his articles, in his talks, and also telling us about how countries like India, especially in Southeast Asia, should uh, should improve, should uh, based on the the, the 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 genetic modified organisms and whatever you have. And he has been a proponent of that, and he's also going to talk about that in in his lectures tomorrow. And as I always say that. We never miss an opportunity to call, invite a visitor to this department. And uh, I'm sure Professor Rich Roberts is an icing on the cake, uh, a Nobel laureate. I'm sure if some, I don't know if some of you remember, I think it's about 30, 35 years ago when uh, Rudolf Mossbohr, uh, another no Nobel laureate, visited uh, the Savitribai Phule uh, University campus, which was then the University of Pune. And if some of you must have read or checked Google as we normally do, the first thing that we go to is Google, is that uh, Professor Rich Roberts has a PhD in organic chemistry. So that's the second reason why I thought it's, it's a must that he should visit the Department of Chemistry at Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. And then he changed uh, directions and moved into biochemistry initially and then molecular biology and his work on gene splicing, restriction enzymes, and uh, also his work in the New England Biolabs uh, is also very famous. And we also have a representative from uh, New England Biolabs who is also fortunately based in Pune. So I have also invited him. So we would like to have the session as an interaction session. I would request Professor Rich Roberts to say a few words uh, before, and then we can start an interactive session. We request the students to to ask questions and this this uh, session is also being uh, webcasted and uh, recorded so those of you who are interested to go look at it again and again can do so so i request professor rich roberts to say a few words to begin with address our students uh, motivate them give us some words of wisdom in their uh, further academic career that they would like to follow professor rich roberts please Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm not sure what I should be telling you, but I'll say one or two things. So one thing I have to say is that if you're in chemistry and you think you have a career in something other than chemistry, then don't hesitate to change. I think there is an awful lot of good projects that you can get involved in, certainly in biology, but also in material science and other things too. So you don't have to feel you have to be a, a very straight line chemist necessarily. The thing I like about biology is we know relatively little about biology. And that means there's always lots of discoveries to make. And one way to sort of give you an illustration of that is that, you know, we thought 
in 2002 that we had sequenced the human genome. And then about two years later, there was a whole bunch more discovered. And in fact, it's only this year that resembles a complete human genome sequence has been produced. And if you look in that genome sequence, you discover only two, maybe 3% of the DNA, we know what it's doing. It's coding for proteins. The rest of it, we don't know what it's doing. We don't know why it's there. Lots of, I don't want it too close, okay. Lots of discoveries to make, lots of things um, that can come from that, and many of which are going to have applications in human health, but many of which are just going to tell us things about biology in general. So we're getting to a point where if we really want to understand the planet and the life that lives on this planet, we're going to have to sequence everything. Unfortunately, sequence is becoming pretty cheap. Um, although some of the cheaper methods are not that accurate, and accuracy is actually quite important if you're doing a new sequence. If you're just resequencing something, accuracy is not quite so important. But I think just being able to read a string of DNA and know what it's coding for and what the products are doing in a cell is ultimately the goal of bioinformatics, if you like. And the chemistry that takes place inside cells is something that's very interesting and something we don't know a lot about. So I, I don't want to say a lot more than that. Um, probably all know, you heard, I'm a big proponent of GMOs, but mainly I'm a proponent of people telling the truth about science. I have a hard time when people go out and start spreading myths and deliberately telling lies about science. That is something that really upsets me. And the thing about science, it's really based on facts. And facts are true whether you believe them or not. And it's really pathetic that we have people, even some scientists, who go around telling stories that are simply not true. So on that note, I'll, I'll stop. I'll take any questions you might have. Of course, if you don't have any questions, we can all go home. Good afternoon. So, uh, so everyone knows that you have worked with uh, James Watson as well. So we would like to know your experience of working with him. Uh -huh. And uh, there's one more question I would like to ask. So my next question is, uh, Alfred Nobel believed that science and literature and peace has made the world a better place and will continue to do so, which has been proven time and again and as recently as COVID-19 crisis. But there were some agencies, especially in the developing world, who spoke against vaccines, which was a direct dig at science as a whole. In such situations, how important do you think it is to communicate science to these agencies, and what role do policymakers play in such circumstances? Okay, so I'm not sure I want to talk about Jim Watson particularly, so let's deal with the second question. I think one of the problems is that politicians have a different agenda from scientists. And I, when I give my talk about GMOs, I always talk about the fact that we need a lot more science in politics. And it would be nice if we had a lot less politics in science. But I think we have to make sure that politicians really listen to the science and understand the science before they go making decisions. And I think that's incredibly difficult, because almost all politicians have a totally different agenda from you or I. So if we're talking about science, I can be talking about things that are going to happen over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years. Politicians have no interest in that. Politicians are interested in what's going to happen between now 
and when they next have to vote, get voted in or out of office. And I, I think it's, it's difficult, partly because an awful lot of scientists do not speak well to the general public. And if it were me, I would make it a rule that when we're training scientists, we teach them how to talk to the general public. And I have something I call the grandmother test, which I think is very good for students. You get a student who is working at the lab doing experiments, um, and I tell them, you should be able to go home, talk to your grandmother, and tell her exactly what you do in words that she understands, and make sure she really does understand what you're saying to a point where she can go and tell all her friends how smart you are. And I think if you practice this, you can really do it. There's absolutely nothing that will stop you. But one of the things that scientists, for the trap they fall into, is a lot of them feel they have to use acronyms, and they've got to use special terms in order to describe what they do. And because if they don't, they think, well, people will think I'm stupid. They won't think I'm a good scientist. They think if I talk in highly technical terms, then you're going to really think seriously that I'm a serious, good person. It's not true. I, I think almost anything you can do, you can use language that everybody can understand in order to explain it. And it's easy enough to practice, practice on friends, practice on people who are not in your area. But a good thing, something I do quite a lot of, is I go to local libraries and give talks in local libraries where the local community comes by, or rotary clubs, and go where there's a very good general population. And if you can talk to this kind of people and you feel that they can understand you, then I think you've really done a good job. But it takes practice. It's not something that is natural to most scientists. You know, someone says, oh, give a talk, and you want to get up and use slides with all sorts of acronyms on it and things that people can't understand. And you know, somehow you think this is going to make you look good. It doesn't. It makes you look foolish, I think, most of the time. So practice, practice, practice. You should do this. It's a very good thing. Uh, as a researcher like the rest of the peoples, till reached to Nobel Prize, and after that? Well, that was the talk I gave this morning. Oh, <laughs> I failed to listen to you. Uh -huh. Maybe a brief it account was recorded. of that. It was recorded. Okay, fine. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, Amaya Bendre and uh, uh, it's very uh, you know i i mean i don't really i really don't have words to express what i'm feeling right now because from past 10 years of my research work what i have been doing 90 percent of it is by virtue of you so uh, first of all i would like to thank organizers for uh, this moment and uh, coming to the questions part on behalf of uh, uh, our students uh, i have a list of uh, about five questions which uh, i would like to ask uh, if you may allow so the uh, first question is a technical one uh, it is uh, uh, let us say a stretch of dna contains uh, introns a b c d okay it forms three protein products let's say x y z uh, X is formed by ABC introns, Y is formed by BCD introns, and Z is formed by ABD introns. Okay, so uh, when a protein is formed, uh, let's say uh, B uh, intron is uh, common in all these. So at structural level, uh, have you found that uh, whether the structural domain or organization of that uh, gene product of B has it been uh, changed uh, by the influence of rest other introns or it has been conserved in these three proteins? Uh, have you come across any such example? Well, I, I'm not completely sure that I understand what you're talking about because introns are the bits that are removed. Oh, sorry, exact. Uh, uh, sorry, exact, okay. exact. But I mean, you know what happens when you join different pieces of proteins together Right, so let's say I've got something, it's got four small components. It may be that if you 
put all four components together, you get a particular function. But if you only put three together, you have a different function. Because it may be that the fourth part is actually guiding the other three. This is not good, is it? I mean, this is me, right? Is it? Or is it you? Are you making this noise? <laughs> No, so, you know, they will guide it to different places. And so there's no general answer to that question. You have to look in detail at individual specific proteins to know what is going to happen and whether they will do. But, you know, typically what is found on an exon is either a whole domain for doing something or part of a domain. Maybe you need two exons to join together and produce something that is, is meaningful. But I, I always like to think of splicing in terms of making a movie. So if you're a director and you're making a movie, you shoot a little scene here and a little scene here and a little scene there. And then you go to the cutting board and you cut and splice and put everything together to make sense. And it may be that you take part A and part B and part A doesn't make any sense by itself, and part B doesn't, but when they're joined together, now you've got a little continuous piece of action. And I think you can think of genes and the way they're organized and the way they make proteins in exactly the same way. I think it really is a good analogy, and it's a nice way of explaining what I do to my grandmother. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, you shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Dr. Philip Sharp for uh, similar work. Uh, did you get any opportunity to collaborate? Or uh, what was the feeling when you came to know that somebody else is working on the same lines? Uh, how one should take it, particularly when we are at the beginning of the project, usually we feel threatened instead of accepting the competition and coming up with a plan to work together. How, about, how should one go about it? Okay, so we didn't know anything about what Phil was doing in detail until we actually already had our results. So it wasn't, really wasn't an issue. But on the other hand, Phil did know what I was doing because I went to his office and explained it to him after I, I was up at Harvard giving a talk and I explained what I was doing. So he had some idea of what we were doing, but I didn't know what he was doing. Yeah, I found it uh, because uh, uh, you both did uh, microscopic uh, experiments and uh, majority of work seemed overlapping. That's why I, I thought about it. Uh, uh, that might be the case. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is about research to industry uh, switch. So you moved to NEB after the uh, Nobel Prize uh, announcement. And what was the motivation behind this academia to industry switch? immediately after the award uh, and uh, especially after spending considerable amount of time at Cold Springer Laboratory and uh, usually this switch is observed uh, among researchers at the earlier stage of their careers. Well, I mean I, I'd already left Cold Spring Harbor and I was working at Biolabs when I won the prize. Oh you had already yeah. left. So okay. and I think that was perhaps why it took so long. To yeah so that's what uh, I'm asking. Uh, uh, why so late? I mean, uh, usually I, we see that yeah. this trend in early stage of careers. So what was the motivation behind okay, that? But you have to step back a little bit. In order to win prizes, you have to be nominated. Right? So Phil Sharp got nominated for every prize going. And I didn't get nominated for any until eventually I was nominated for the Nobel Prize because someone called Jim Watson and said, when are you going to nominate someone from Cold Spring Harbor so that Phil Sharp can get his Nobel Prize? Right. I'd never won a prize before the Nobel Prize. It was the first prize I won. Thank you, sir. And the last question from our side uh, is, uh, through the student's point of view, many times it happens that the prior research experience or uh, formal education doesn't match with the field of interest. Uh, under such circumstances, as a student, how one should convince the new mentor or the employer to give uh, an opportunity, uh, especially uh, when there is a, a change of field is concerned? Right, but you know, I mean, the essence of teaching and the essence of education is to learn how to reason logically, 
how to take a set of facts and put them together in some sensible way. I, I don't think that specialty education is necessarily a good thing. It can teach you a lot about a particular subject. It doesn't always teach you how to think about things unless the education course has been set up that way so that you really do have to think. And I was lucky because this guy, Professor Ollis, who um, was head of chemistry and who I eventually did a PhD with, he taught undergraduates in a very special way where if you wanted to follow his course and do well in exams, you had to really understand the subject. It wasn't enough just to memorize facts, and a lot of lecturers just you know, ask you to memorize facts. This was how inorganic chemistry was taught in Sheffield, for instance. You know, professor, well, it wasn't even a professor. He was a, a lecturer at the time. I mean, just basically wrote a series of facts on a form on, a, on the blackboard and said, remember these, which, you know, that's ridiculous. It's crazy. You know, Google could answer that, um, I think. It's better that if you're teaching people and setting exams, you should not, not do it and do it in such a way that Google could do it. Right. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, first of all, a great fan of Nepcutter module. And uh, I had a question that uh, is there really a platform? for scientists to do better work, which will get acclaimed. Or you can sit in any corner of the world and do great science and get the credit that you deserve. Well, you know, doing good science is always that there's a mix of things that are involved. One is you have to be able to think pretty clearly and ask good questions and work out ways to deal with it. But it's also incredibly important to have good colleagues, people that you can talk to. If there's something, a question you want to ask and you don't really understand, it's good if there's someone you can go and talk to about that. But it's also good that you have access to appropriate laboratory equipment. So we were lucky when we made the splicing discovery that I came up with an, an experiment. It was an electron microscopy experiment. I'm not an electron microscopist, but we had someone just down the hall who was. And we went and talked to them, and they said, yeah, we can do this experiment. And so, lo and behold, they did the experiment. And this picture I'd drawn on the blackboard was essentially what they saw in the electron microscope. So it, you know, if we didn't have an electron microscope or someone who knew how to do that, I'd have to go around and find somebody else to do the experiment for me. Yeah. So it's, you, you okay. need all of those things. Yeah. So you, having been visited all the countries, all the parts of the world, I would like to ask, where do you see India today? And when you started off, do you uh, have you seen a gradual increase or a sudden increase? Or what's the trend been for India? So you're asking what I see as the future for India? Yeah, and the past, what you have observed according to science, mm -hmm. because it will be a third person perspective okay. for so, us. So, you know, there are a lot of very smart people here in India and a lot of very good scientists. And some of them have worked in my field, and I'm familiar with the work they've done. They do good work. I think here you have a problem with the availability of equipment very often, and the labs are not um, equipped as well as they could be. But again, the people who do well here tend to find ways of convincing the government or whoever to give them the money to buy the equipment that they need. And so, you know, a lot of doing science or doing anything is advocacy for yourself um, to make sure that you get the equipment that you need. And I've, you know, it's, <clears throat> there are some people who are very good at asking for things and other people are not very good at asking for things. And I think one of the problems I see here in India is that there are a terrific number of very smart girls, and they don't advocate enough for themselves. They really get run down by the men, and I don't like that. It happens everywhere, but I think it's pretty bad here. It's almost a societal thing that women are, are not treated as well as they should be here. I did a an award, well, a convocation at the University of Mumbai a few years ago, 
and I was asked to present prizes to the winners. And so I noticed that all of the winners coming through who were winning, they were all women. There were two guys and maybe 20 girls. And so when I gave a talk afterwards, I said, you know, I thought these boys would do very well if they actually went home and looked after the family and let their wives go to work and earn the money. Um, I got a standing ovation for that. But I think it's true. It really is true. But and you need to be activists. You, you have to speak up for yourself because it's very rare that you'll find somebody else who will speak up for you because they, they don't know your circumstances in the way that you do. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. it does answer. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to ask you a question that is there with, I think, most of the people. Uh, when you enter into a research, there is an immense amount of stress that goes with uh, failed experiments and papers not getting published uh -huh. soon enough. So uh, there can be any kind of stress, maybe personal, be it in research. How did you deal with all of it? Well, I, I don't suffer from stress. I have a philosophy that if you come across a situation, you can either do something about it, or you can't. If you can do something about it, do it. And if you can't, don't worry. So if you sit on an airplane, right, it bumps about, and you think, oh my god, it's going to crash. But you can't do anything about it. So don't worry. It's going to be OK. Right? Thank you. I, I the same is generally true in life. You know, there are people who worry. A lot of the ladies tend to worry far more than they should. Um, but there are plenty of men who worry too. But it really, do not worry. It kills more people than anything I know. It's way, way worse than almost any infectious disease we have out there. Thank you, that was okay. helpful. from the students, no? Yeah, maybe a last one from the students. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. Sir, uh, you are an active proponent of GMO, as you said uh, mm -hmm. a few time ago. Uh, GMO is something uh, in general public, even in the field of science, people don't have idea. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, GMO in food, uh, food like food sciences and agriculture is something which is really important to be talked about and there are various issues with uh, health involved with uh, GMO crops and also in long run it is not good for soil this is what it has been observed in the areas of Punjab and all because of salinity and it requires a lot of input of fertilizers and all so I would like your comments on this and how is uh, current technology or current uh, research going into this field. Okay, so I think first thing, what you're saying is not true. So you don't need more fertilizer, you just need an appropriate amount of fertilizer. And again, it depends very much upon the crop that you have. Um, some crops need more fertilizers than others. There are also ways that one could think about improving the soils using GM technology. You can also do it by planting the appropriate amount of, or the, the appropriate plants in order to do things. But in general, traditional breeding gives plants that are far more likely to cause problems than plants that are produced by the GM approach. And the reason is when you traditionally breed plants, you've got one genome, you've got a genome, you join them, half of the genes are from here and half are from here, you don't know which halves. And all you do is you select for ones that have the appropriate properties. But when I make a GM crop, I know what gene I want from here. And I put it into the plant, and I know where it goes, and I can check that it's OK. And if it's going to have any deleterious effect on the original plant that it's gone into, that you can do in field tests very easily. It doesn't take a lot of effort to do it. And so. The thing is, the way in which you make better plants is not really that important. It's 
What does the plant do? Is it safe? Is it not safe? Does it grow well? Does it not grow well? And I think the criteria for judging whether you've got a plant that is useful is exactly the same, whether it's a GM plant or whether it's a traditionally bred plant. And, you know, it's, I, I'll give you a, a sort of a, an example. So if you go into a store and you see a very nice dress, right, and you look and you say, wow, that's a good dress, I'm going to try it on, and you look really good in it, do you go and ask how it was made? Is that the thing that you first do? No, you look and you say, wow, I look good in this dress, I'm going to buy it. Same should be true for GM crops. Do they perform as they should, or do they not? Don't forget that typically you've got a plant that you have made into a GM plant in which 99.99999% of the genes are identical before you put in this one or two genes that you wanted to put in. And there's no reason to think it's going to be particularly deleterious in any way, but you can test, you can, you can find out. But I think if you make a cross between two separate plants where you've got 100 genes going in and you have no idea what they are and you don't know how to test for them, doesn't that sound to you as though it's something that would be more dangerous than putting in one gene that you know what it is? So GM, you know, we have 30 years of experience. There's not been a single problem, not one. Okay, in Europe, they import millions of tons of GM soybean in order to feed cattle, in order to feed sheep, right? So if these GM crops are so dangerous, why don't the animal activists get up and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing this, right? Diabetics, stuff human insulin into them. You think this comes from humans? No, it comes from a, a GM, a genetically modified organism, right? Is that dangerous? You know, should we stop that? Well, you don't hear them talking about that. They don't say anything about that. The hypocrisy here is quite unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. And all it tells you is that the anti-GMO movement had nothing to do with danger. It had to do with politics, and it had to do with money. And it turned out, as soon as Greenpeace were anti-Monsanto, anti-GMO, their income tripled. Okay? They make 500 million euros a year because of, or it started because of their anti-GMO stands. And they started off in what you might consider a good way. They say, well, the science has not been done. Right, let's do some science and see whether it's safe or not. Well, the science has been done and shown that it's safe. So why don't they come out and say that? Right? Because it's politically and financially beneficial for them not to. It's, there is just so much hypocrisy here. And this is what I don't like about it. You know, the science is very clear. The science says these things are perfectly safe. You know, if you live in the US, you eat papaya. Almost all of that papaya is GM papaya that's come from Hawaii. Okay, have you heard any problems with it? No, there have been none, zero. So you, you really have to, have to ask why people do things. And usually they do it for money. And that's the origin of the GM movement, the anti-GM movement, is money. Hello. So uh, last but not least. Oh, uh, you're there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, li uh, would like to know, curious about uh, how Lo Nobel laureate uh, gets shortlisted. Uh -huh. So, somebody who is trying to <laughs> get helpful, I mean, how is the procedure and how is the last round about? <clears throat> so, I don't know. <laughs> so, basically, you get nominated and there are a large number of people, maybe all previous not laureates are allowed to nominate in their category. Universities, presidents and so on get um, invitations. There are probably a thousand invitations go out every year and you're invited to, to nominate. But what happens after that is kept secret for 50 years. And the records of the Nobel committees come out after 50 years. So if you want to know what happened to someone 50 years ago, then you can go read about it and you can find it. But if you want to know what happened to me, you have to wait another 20 years. <laughs> Hello, sir. Good afternoon.
so everyone know about bt cotton and uh, current issue is uh, insect also co evolving with bt cotton so sat I'll hold the microphone a little further away okay uh, can i repeat that's better so to overcome this insect resistance scientists suggest that we have to uh, recomb uh, we have to change the combination of cryogen which codes for crystal protein so instead of that do we have any other approach to overcome this issue because uh, after some time we have no more combination like we have just 17 genes so i'm i'm not sure i understood the question did you understand it that you can okay so i will repeat uh, so insects are co evolving with bt cotton yeah. Uh -huh. So to overcome this issue, uh, what we do is uh, 17 genes which code for crystal protein. That cryogenes, we are recombinate, we are uh, changing its combination, like cry one and cry two. In one crop, we are using cry one and cry two. Uh, insects are resistant to that plant. After some time, they are changing to cry one A to cry one B. So how long we are going to continue this? Process like after some time we have no more combination, and insects are also resistant. So, what will be the next step of GMO? Well, for instance, let's just think about BT. Do you know what BT is? Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah, but do you know where it comes from? Uh, I'm not no. sure. Okay, so about it comes from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. Hmm. Okay, and this is what organic farmers use to kill pests. So they spray this all over their plants, right? But apparently that's perfectly okay, but if you put the gene into the plant, it's a problem. Now, as with everything, eventually the insects will figure out how to become resistant to it. It's just like if I give you an antibiotic and you have a bacterial infection, you get rid of most of them, but eventually they discover that they can live with the antibiotic and then you have to come up with another one. And the same will be true for BT genes, that they go in, insects will figure out eventually how to do it, although in the south, southern part of the US and in South Africa, they've not figured out how to do, how to do that yet, but insects will be different. But the nice thing is that Bacillus thuringiensis, there are thousands of species, and they make different Bt toxins. And so you could easily imagine taking a different Bt toxin and put it into the plant, having tested that it's killing the insect successfully. And it's just like regular agriculture. You buy seeds from companies, and they keep changing because the insects become resistant or something else becomes resistant. And so you have to change. You know, it's called biology, it's called evolution. Everything changes. So you don't expect to have a solution that is going to last forever. It just isn't going to happen, All right? So you have to be prepared for the fact that you will make changes. But if you have to do that by traditional breeding methods, it typically takes 20, 30 years to breed a new variety. But using GM approaches, you can do it in two years, three years, you can do it very quickly. And so it's a much faster way of dealing with the problem. But it is, you know, if anybody were to tell you it's gonna be a universal solution forever, it's not. Biology doesn't work that way. Biology is constantly changing. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, and being uh, biotechnologists in training, uh, we feel like God, like doctors are God, who have a life in their hand. So do we have the fate of uh, plants or animals that we are trying to modify? So there's that kind of guilt. But I do agree that GMOs are better for humankind. And I don't know about nature, but for sure for humankind. So how do I convince people who are, who are not having science background or probably anti-GMOs that this is a better option than uh, where we are leading to. Mm -hmm. Coming from you as a Nobel laureate will really count. Right, so you know, there are some people who you can talk to and they're reasonable and they understand what you say. And there are other people who've made up their mind and no matter what you say, they're not going to change it. But I'll tell you an interesting story. 
I go around and talk in schools. And I went and talked to a school of 11 and 12 year olds uh, about GMOs. And they'd all been told that afterwards they had to write to me and tell me what they thought about my presentation. And there were seven or eight of them who wrote and they said this was the first time that they'd ever been spoken to as though they were adults, which I thought was a pretty devastating remark on the teacher, but still. But one girl wrote to me and she said she'd gone home and talked to her parents who were anti-GMO. They heard what she said that I told them and they changed their minds. They became pro-GMO. I had a similar experience with an Italian senator, a lady, when I first made a, a presentation about this. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, you were saying things I've just never heard before. And part of the problem is that there is no balance in the messaging going out to the general public. And thanks to social media, as soon as you pick up on one thing, you're just going to get a hundred times amplification of exactly the same message. And so we have to make sure that we talk as much as we can and make sure that people hear all sides of a story. But some people are not going to change because they, they just have their minds made up. No, no, no. The argument that I usually, the argument I usually give relates to the ease of doing things. And I always talk about people, let's say I've got a GPS system in my car and I want to put it into my new car, which doesn't have one. Do I take that car apart and then mix everything up and put it in my new car and select the version with the GPS system? Well, no, I don't. I unplug the GPS system from my old car and I plug it into my new one. That's the genetic, that's the GM approach. Right? But they will tell you, Greenpeace will tell you, if you take that GPS system from an airplane and put it in your car, now your car's going to fly. Right? Well, you know, we know this is nonsense. And I, I think this is, it's using analogies that really show how stupid some of these arguments are that eventually will get you there. But personally, I think if people tell lies about GMs in order to you know, make money or whatever they're doing, I'd put them in jail. I, it's just not right. You should not be allowed to lie about science. And I think politicians who do that, they should go to jail too. It's, this isn't a good thing to do. You know, the one thing we have in this world that really you can believe in is science. And the people who try to discredit science and tell you that things are not true, that really are true, for which we have good factual evidence, they're misleading everybody. And they're not good. They shouldn't be in political life. Hello. Uh, hello, what? sir. What? Uh, good afternoon. OK. Uh, so hello. Many of us want to know that. Bean, uh, what message would you like to give us to all the young researchers so that uh, we can make through our research in such a way that in future anyone among us may go towards the Nobel Prize? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I always say I wrote an article for um, PLOS Biology, I think it was, or it's one of the PLOS journals anyway some time ago, in which I, the article was entitled 10 Rules to Win a Nobel Prize. And the first rule was do not make it a goal in life to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and the reason, the simple reason is that it's luck, right? No one, almost no one, does a piece of work in order to win a Nobel Prize. Because usually it's serendipity, it's chance. Something went wrong in your experiments. And then you discover why it went wrong. And then you make the discovery. Uh, so d never make it um, in. You should, you should read the article. I'm the only author, so R.J. Roberts, and it's in one of the PLOS journals, and it's 10 simple rules to win a Nobel Prize.
Okay, and one more question. Uh, in the morning, you mentioned in your session that you always wanted to become a detector and uh, you used to solve many puzzles in your childhood. So do you still spend time in solving those puzzles? Well, I do, but I'm also a detective because if you do research, you're a detective. But I of course, love, yes, you are yeah, still a detective. I love puzzles. I really like puzzles. I especially like word games. I'm very keen on word games. Sudoku I like. Go, chess. I, I like these games, although I don't play much chess these days. I used to play with my son, and when I played with my kids, I would never let them win. Okay, I just do not feel you ever do kids a, a, a favor by letting them win. And so I played with my son until about six years ago. Um, we played regularly, and, but it was by email. And then all of a sudden, and he'd never beaten me, and then all of a sudden he beat me. And I thought, well, you know, this is good. I, I, I have no problem with my kids beating me. This is great. And so then he won again a few games later. And then he started to win all the time. And I thought I'd better find out what's going on. And so I called him up. We had a conversation. And he said, well, he'd been taking lessons from a Russian grandmaster. I thought, great, that's OK. But then a few months later, he said, you know, it's really no fun playing with you anymore. It's too easy to beat you. So we don't play anymore. Thank you, sir. Yeah, OK. Maybe I'll just add a few things. I mean, just maybe one. One of the tips that he has given in that article is study biology. <laughs> Collaborate with Swedish scientists. Collaborate with a few scientists, not more. Uh, because if you choose chemistry, your chances of getting the Nobel Prize are already half. Because most of the chemistry Nobel Prizes go to biologists. Go to biology, that's right. So he has given <laughs> several evidences of that. So, don't, don't leave this hall immediately. You please stick to chemistry. <laughs> OK, so uh, it's good uh, that we had a very nice uh, interactive session. We would like to thank uh, Professor Rich Roberts for spend, sparing some time in busy schedule. We are trying to organize many uh, e events so that most of the students get the benefit of at least listening to him. And I said, I think this opportunity is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. Uh, I'm lucky we had one in somewhere in 1988 uh, when Rudolf Mosbor was here. And I'm not sure when will be the next opportunity. Surely I will not be here. But it's nice that he could spend some time here. We would like to take this opportunity to thank him. Uh, we will all gather outside uh, near, near the new chemistry building for a photograph uh, in about five minutes time. And he will visit the central instrumentation facility by then. Thank you once again for uh, coming for the session. Thank you. Thank you.